This is a video about structures. In previous videos we have seen propositional logic, which is a great tool for combinatorics and computer science, but it is not suited to formalize all of mathematics. We would like to have a logic which is powerful enough also for algebra, calculus, probability, geometry. Structures are a convenient and flexible way to talk about the objects in all of those areas. Most of you have already seen plenty of examples of structures, perhaps without knowing the general concept. Roughly speaking, a structure consists of a set, called the domain or the base set or the universe, together with a set of operations on that set and a set of relations on that set. In algebra, for example, Z2 with addition modulo 2 is a structure. But also all groups, rings, fields, ordered fields are examples of certain structures. In discrete mathematics, for example, graphs and partial orders are examples of structures. In computer science, databases can be viewed as structures. We now introduce structures formally. For that, we have to start with the concept of a signature. This is simply a set of function symbols, typically denoted by f1, f2, and so on, and relation symbols, typically denoted by r1, r2, and so on. Each of the symbols is equipped with an arity, which is a natural number. For example, the signature of graphs consists of a single binary relation symbol. Typically, this is the letter E for edges. The signature of abelian groups consists of a binary function symbol for the addition in the group, a unary function symbol for the additive inverse, and a function symbol of arity zero for the identity in the group. So this is a signature that only has function symbols. Then there are also signatures where both function symbols and relation symbols appear, like for example the signature of ordered groups, where we have additionally a binary relation symbol. However, note that at this point the concept of a signature is a syntactic concept. A signature is just a set of symbols. We don't know yet what they are supposed to mean. If tau is a signature, then a tau structure is defined as follows. First of all, a structure has a base set. We typically use the same letter for the base set and for the structure itself, except that the structure will be underlined. In printed documents, one often uses fraktur font for structures or bold font or calligraphic font. Then the structure has for each function symbol f in the signature an operation over b of the respective arity. We write the structure into the superscript of the function symbol to denote the respective operation of the structure. Moreover, the structure carries for each relation symbol R in the signature a relation over B of the respective arity. Again, we write the structure into the superscript to distinguish between the relation symbol and the associated relation of the structure. In practice, one is often sloppy with the distinction between function symbols and the respective operations. For example, one usually writes r plus minus zero for the additive group of the real numbers. The signature here is the signature of abelian groups that we have seen earlier, and the math letter r denotes the real numbers. And everybody is happy because everybody knows the usual definition of the addition operation over the reals, and the additive inverse, and zero. Quite often you will find app use of notation, the same letter being used for the function symbol and the respective operation of the structure. But usually this doesn't cause any trouble. Today we have two running examples of special types of structures. A graph consists of a set, also called the vertex set, and a set of edges, which are two element subsets of the vertex set. So graphs can be nicely visualized, as on the right. A graph can be viewed as a structure with a signature that contains just a single binary relation symbol. Typically, we use a capital E. The relation for E in the structure contains all ordered pairs UV such that the set UV is an edge in the graph. 
Our second running example are groups. A group is a structure with the signature of groups that we have already seen, such that addition is associative, zero denotes the neutral element with respect to addition, and minus x denotes the additive inverse of x. A linearly ordered group is a group that additionally carries a linear order, which is compatible with the group structure in the following sense. If a is less than b, then c plus a is less than c plus b for all a, b, c in the group. So this is a property that you know from the additive group of the rationals or reals with respect to the usual ordering. We have a number of general definitions that work for all structures. We will define substructures and extensions, reducts and expansions, and homomorphisms. And we will discuss how these definitions specialize in our two running examples, graphs and groups. We start with defining substructures. Let A and B be structures with the same signature. Then A is a substructure of B if, first, the domain of A is contained in the domain of B. Second, for every relation symbol R in the signature tau, a tuple A over capital A is contained in the relation R of the structure A if and only if it is contained in the relation R of the structure B. Third, for every function symbol F and every tuple A over capital A, the function for f of the structure a and the function for f of the structure b agree on the tuple a. In other words, on the elements of a, the two structures look the same. We then also say that b is an extension of a. Note that if g is an arbitrary subset of b, then there is a smallest substructure of b that contains g. This structure is called the substructure of B generated by G. Let's have a look at substructures of groups, one of our running examples. In the case of groups, substructure and subgroup means the same thing. This is because of the choice of our signature. Since we have a constant symbol for the identity in our signature, every substructure of B must contain the identity of B. Since we have a unary operation symbol for the inverses, every substructure of B must contain, for every element x, also minus x. And every substructure of B must be closed under composition. Moreover, a substructure of a group also satisfies the three identities for groups that we specified earlier, since we only have to verify them on a smaller domain. So, a substructure of a group is indeed a subgroup, and in fact, the substructures of a group B are precisely the subgroups of B. This would not be true if we would only have one symbol for composition in our structure. Let's have a look at the substructures in the context of graphs. Here we don't have any function symbols in the signature, so every subset of the domain is a substructure. Now it is important to note that a substructure A of a graph B corresponds to what is called an induced subgraph of B in graph theory. Loosely speaking, we obtain an induced subgraph by removing vertices and removing all edges that involve these vertices. Graph theory also studies so-called weak subgraphs, sometimes just called subgraphs, where we are not only allowed to remove vertices, but we are also allowed to remove edges. So the clique with three vertices would have a path with two edges as a subgraph, but not as an induced subgraph. Another basic definition for structures is the definition of reduct and expansion. For substructures, the signature stays the same, but we change the domain. For reducts, the signature changes and the domain stays the same. So if B is a tau structure and Rho is a subset of tau, then the rho reduct of B is the rho structure obtained from B by simply dropping the relations and functions that are not mentioned in rho. Conversely, if A is a reduct of B, then we say that B is an expansion of A. 
An example is the structure we obtain from the two element group if we just keep the composition operation of the group. Our third and last general definition for structures for today is the definition of homomorphism. Again, suppose that A and B are structures with the same signature. A function from the domain of A to the domain of B is called a homomorphism if it preserves all relations and operations. Formally, a function H from A to B is a homomorphism if for every relation symbol R in the signature and every tuple in the relation for R in A, the tuple obtained by applying H component-wise is in the relation for R in B. Moreover, for every function symbol F in the signature, instead of first applying H component-wise to a tuple and then applying the function for F in B, we can first apply the function for F in A and then apply H component-wise. And we will get the same value. If you check what this means, for example, for groups, you will see that the definition specializes to the definition of group homomorphisms that you already know. The specialization to graphs is also interesting. For example, the three colorability problem can be phrased using homomorphisms. The graph three colorability problem is the following computational problem. The input is a finite graph G. And the question is whether there is a homomorphism from G to the clique with three vertices, often called K3. If we imagine the three vertices of K3 as three different colors, then finding such a homomorphism is precisely the question whether we can color the vertices of the graph so that adjacent vertices get different colors. The reason is that the edge relation of K3 does not contain pairs of the form x, x. And the homomorphism sends edges to edges. So adjacent vertices in G should not be mapped to the same vertex x. This problem is very well motivated. Imagine that you run a mobile company and that you own some mobile phone stations. Some of the stations might be close to each other so that if they would operate on the same frequency, they would interfere with each other. You need to buy the licenses for the frequencies and you only have the money for three different frequencies. You would like to know whether you can assign three frequencies to your mobile stations so that the stations do not interfere. This can be modeled as an instance of the three coloring problem. The vertices are mobile phone stations and you put an edge between two stations if they would interfere with each other. It is open whether this problem can be solved efficiently by a computer. One can show that if this problem can be solved in polynomial time, then the $1 million satisfiability problem for propositional logic from the previous session can be solved in polynomial time as well. This is the reason why researchers believe that the three colorability problem cannot be solved in polynomial time. I will now present a famous concrete mathematical graph coloring problem called the Hadwiger Nelson problem. We consider the unit distance graph. The vertices of this graph are all points in the plane. So the graph has a lot of vertices. We put an edge between two points if the points are at distance one in the plane. The question is now, what is the smallest number n so that there is a homomorphism from the unit distance graph to kn? 
a priori it is not even clear that n can be chosen to be finite. But in fact, it is known that such a homomorphism exists for n equals 7. Only recently it was shown that n has to be at least 5. But what precisely the smallest n is, is open. And here comes another fact about this problem. And is, this is also the connection to logic. Using the compactness theorem for first order logic that we prove later in the course, one can show that an infinite graph has a homomorphism to Kn if and only if all finite subgraphs have a homomorphism to Kn. This shows that in order to solve the hadwiger nelson problem, it suffices to find a five coloring for all finite subgraphs of the unit distance graph. What I find fascinating about logic is that it is extremely general, but at the same time one can derive substantial statements from general model theoretic theorems. I would like to illustrate this with another application of the compactness theorem, but this time in the context of our other running example, groups. A group is called torsion-free if the only element of finite order in G is zero. In other words, if you take a group element different from zero and you keep on adding this element, you never reach zero. It is easy to see that every ordered group must be torsion-free. With the compactness theorem from first order logic, it will be relatively easy to see that for abelian groups, we have a converse to this. Every torsion-free abelian group can be expanded to an ordered group. This is a result due to Levy. To formulate the compactness theorem from, for first order logic, we first have to introduce first order logic. And this will be the topic of the next video.